Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this evening on the role of skin care in oncology patients. As always, it's great to see so many familiar names with us. Thank you so much for joining us. This evening, we have as guest speaker, Dr. Maxwell Sauter. Dr. Sauter is oncodermatologist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center and director of Pigmented Lesion Clinic at the Toronto Dermatology Center. We also have as guest speaker, Dr. Joël Claveau, who is oncodermatologist at the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Clinic Center in Le Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Québec, Hôtelieu de Québec, in Quebec City. We would like to thank our sponsor this evening, La Roche-Posée, who has been uh, able to make this educational event possible. The webinar this evening is going to present to you a publication that just came out last month in the Skin Therapy Letter. As you know, the Skin Therapy Letter is a prestigious dermatology journal indexed with the National uh, Library and is part of the PubMed and Medline searches. So you can access this publication after the webinar at skintherapyletter.com. And you can also access all Skin Therapy Letter dermatology articles at skintherapyletter.com. Before we start, a couple of technical tips for you. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you'd like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your web browser. You will also be emailed to this survey one to two days after. If you could fill it out and send it back to us, we'd truly appreciate it. Also, within one to two days of the webinar recording, our presenters this evening has graciously given us the permission to send you the recording of this program, and you will also receive your certificate of attendance. Again, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And I've just typed in a, uh, a little note there uh, saying, please type your questions here for our pan panelists so you see where you need to type in your questions. So without further ado, I will pass the floor virtually to Dr. Sauter. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Roxanne. And uh, thank you everyone for coming this evening. Just gonna make sure that I have control. Excellent. So just to get a sense of where everyone's from and uh, what everyone does, I'd like to start with a quick polling question asking, are you involved in the care of oncology patients in your community? Yes or no? Pretty straightforward. So we'll give that a uh, little bit of time just to see what the composition of the group is. Okay, uh, so 77% of, of people welcome, 23%, I think you're in the uh, another webinar uh, for some reason. Uh, but no, hopefully uh, everyone will be able to take away something uh, directly from this. And just a, as a, oh, I guess there wasn't a follow-up question. Was there a second question, Roxanne, that we were gonna do? Yep, there was a yeah. second question. Okay, so um, follow up to that for the 77% of people. If you are involved in uh, oncology care, are you involved in multidisciplinary cancer team? Uh, so do you work directly with uh, some of your uh, colleagues in, in other specialties? <clears throat> Okay, so about 50 50, uh, more so not involved in multidisciplinary care. Okay, great. Hopefully, we can um, promote some cross collaboration here. So, this evening, as Roxanne said, we're going to basically be going over uh, the first paper that a group of us put together in hopefully what will become a series of papers, um, really to set the table for the importance of oncodermatology, especially in Canada. And what we're going to do is I'm going to briefly go over cancer in Canada and, and why this is such an important issue. I'll pass the floor over to um, Dr. Claveau to go over uh, common skin toxicities that we, we find ourselves encountering. And then we're going to look at the evidence or the lack thereof 
of uh, best skin care approach for uh, cancer treatment related skin toxicities. So as I mentioned, uh, a group of us got together and called ourselves the Canadian Skin Management in Oncology Project. Um, really uh, getting together a group of multidisciplinary care providers, including oncologists, nurses, um, dermatologists, radiation oncologists, um, pharmacists. Um, and what we wanted to do was um, to develop um, a framework to improve patient outcomes through the prevention or management of, of cancer treatment related toxicities. And uh, what we came out with was, again, the first in a series of, of several articles um, looking at a consensus article um, to discuss uh, really the issues that, that surround people uh, going through their cancer journey. And uh, this is uh, just a snapshot of, of the skin cancer therapy letter. And what we hoped to look at was what the data was behind uh, looking at trying to prevent or uh, treating through dermocosmetic regimens uh, skin toxicities. And we'll explore that a little further on in the presentation. So why is this important? Well, in terms of cancer, cancer is a big problem, unfortunately in Canada as well as globally. And if we look at the incidence of cancer per 100,000 population, this is based on 2018 data, and Canada is uh, number 11 in terms of uh, the uh, global incidence. And that number is actually likely underrepresented because it doesn't in fact include non-melanoma skin cancers, which we know are by far the most common cancer, let alone skin cancer, um, that is prevalent in the Canadian population. And so per 100,000 population, we may actually be even higher, uh, considering that some of this data from Australia and New Zealand does account for the uh, non-melanoma skin cancer. Each year, the Canadian Cancer Society puts out their projections for cancer in Canada. And for 2020, it's estimated that 225,800 Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer. Uh, this year. And out of that, unfortunately, 83,400 will die of cancer. And this is the number one cause of, of death in, in Canada. And it affects essentially everyone. One, one in two Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetime, and uh, one in four Canadians will die from cancer in their lifetime. And so, you know, this isn't um, a rare occurrence. In terms of what Canadians are being diagnosed with. The four most common diagnosed cancers in Canada are lung, breast, prostate, colorectal, that includes colon and rectal um, separate, separate. And uh, in 2020, these four alone will account for approximately half of all the cancer diagnoses as well as half the cancer deaths. And if we look at the statistics uh, in terms of what's happening with the incidence, when we started measuring the incidence in 1984 to present date, we're looking at a growth across the board in terms of new cases for both male and female. And in terms of age standardized incidence rates, uh, males are slightly decreasing, but not by much, and women are increasing slightly. At the same time, while the incidence are going up, the five-year survival rate um, is going up as well for a variety of reasons, including detection, more advanced um, uh, treatments, um, and more uh, public education uh, programs in terms of prevention, especially with regards to anti-smoking or uh, smoking sensation. And so even though uh, there are five across the top and there are only four lines, colon and rectal, once more are uh, basically the same, but you can see that all these lines, the five-year survival rate uh, is increasing significantly. And so what this leads to overall is we've got an increase in cancer incidence rate, a decrease in mortality rate, and an increase in five-year overall survival rate. And so that means that today, more Canadians than ever are living with or surviving from cancer. And because of that, more Canadians are living with the sequela of anti-cancer treatments that also include skin changes. 
And so us as dermatologists or skincare teams um, can have a profound impact on uh, these patients. And so with that, I will uh, pass the floor over virtually to my friend, Dr. Claveau, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Max. Thanks, uh, Roxanne, for the great organization. Thanks to La Rose Pose for putting that together. It's um, good. Uh, it's excellent to have a big group of people like uh, we have tonight, um, a week uh, before the holiday. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to talk to you tonight about the various uh, associated skin toxicities that we have, really, over the uh, last few years, we have seen a growing uh, a number of uh, skin toxicity. Of course, in the past, we used to see a lot of patients with radiodermatitis and uh, chemotherapy-associated uh, toxicity, but now we have plenty of new treatment. So really, cancer treatments right now, as uh, Dr. Sauder mentioned, it's one half of the population suffering from cancer. Uh, every day we see patients uh, that have had cancer or are actually uh, being treated right now, and either they have a surgery, um, often after or even before the surgery, they will have radiotherapy and the classic uh, chemo. So really, the big cancer are really uh, breast cancer, prostate, and uh, lung cancer, along with colon cancer. And in many of those cancers, we have surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. But for the, with the research coming up right now, and uh, big discoveries in the role of uh, the targeted therapy with some uh, uh, inhibitors at various uh, levels, we will see that they have also side effects. And really, in the last five years, the big revolution is immunotherapy. So really, dermatologists have to be aware of all those different uh, um, options of treatment and uh, be able to manage. As I mentioned, the traditional therapies are radiotherapy, chemo, and hormonal therapy. Hormonal therapy. Uh, sorry. Approximately 50% of the patients with cancer are receiving radiotherapy either before sometime uh, as the, the main treatment replacing surgery or as a complement of their treatment, for example, head and neck cancer. And we know radiotherapy damaging the DNA and uh, creating some damage to the skin. So it's not uh, rare. It's not rare that we have uh, acute and chronic dermatitis often up to 90% and more of the patient. For example, 87% of breast cancer, 90% of head and neck patients. It's so frequent that radio oncologists don't even send us the patient anymore. They treat uh, very uh, appropriately the patient, and often the dermatology will be asked to treat the more severe uh, eruption. It's often dependent of the dose, the side, often on the head and neck, it's a more fragile uh, skin. Same thing, uh, the doors are very high in uh, head and neck cancer. Same thing for breasts. It's not rare that we have concomitant reaction. For example, we can have recall dermatitis after chemotherapy, after targeted therapy. Some medication can promote radiodermatitis uh, dermatitis by increasing sensitivity. So that, as I mentioned, the acute is one to four weeks, can be mild with some desquamation and erythema, can be severe with some uh, acute reaction with bleeding and ulceration. Chronically, we see pigment changes, we see dyschromia, we see uh, scarring, sclerosis, and it's not rare for uh, us in dermatology to, to see, let's say, a basal cell or a squamous cell 10, 15, 20 years after the radiation. The classic is a patient that has been treated with uh, uh, mental uh, radiotherapy on the trunk and that have developed many basal cell carcinoma years down the road. Those are uh, 
images of acute and uh, mild to moderate radiodermatitis, erythema, desquamation, and oozing and crusting in the more severe phase. And really, we will see the term, but I think derm uh, dermatology care, skin care, uh, can be uh, increased, and the patient needs some advice about that. Mild uh, uh, dyscomia, hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation on the neck, and later on, we can have uh, poikilodermia with some uh, telangiectasia and scarring. Atrophy. Chemo, of course, we disrupt the cycle of the cell by treating with uh, different uh, anti-metabolite drugs. We work at the DNA level, level and we're not surprised that uh, it will act on their air growth, it will act on the nail growth, and of course will give a lot of uh, uh, skin rashes. There is some non-specific rash and specific rashes. Eruption. Of course, the side effect of chemo, uh, we know nausea, uh, GI symptoms, uh, pain, swelling, and skin irritation. You see skin irritation is vague. Often in the uh, on medical oncologists, uh, medical oncology trials, it's not very clear, rash or skin irritation. It can be a reason for asking us to see the patient up to 10% of the visit and can be a 5% of emergency visit in a, can in a cancer center. This is a long list of the side effects we see with chemo. Of course, air loss from anagen effluvium, Thrombophlebitis, we can have some uh, uh, irritation or necrosis at the site of the uh, uh, injection, hyperpigmentation, and various rashes. As I mentioned, non specific eruption, xerosis, pruritus, mucositis, nail changes, and specific eruption with taxane and in foot syndrome with doxorubicin, intertigenous eruptions, inflamed actinic keratosis can be life-threatening sometimes, but rare. This is a classic uh, syndrome you can have with taxane or doxorubicin. This is a flagellate hyperpigmentation you can have with gliomycin, gliomycin or others. This is also a classic presentation with doxorubicin where the uh, eruption is more in the intertrigenous uh, area, can lead to hyperpigmentation later on. And it's more uh, rare, but we can have some uh, skin changes with hormonal therapy, uh, vaginitis, vaginal atrophy. Of course, we can have alopecia, and uh, some other uh, skin changes, even sometimes uh, acne from eruptions, depending on the type of hormonal therapy the patient is receiving. The big interesting uh, point right now for the dermatology community is the new uh, side effects we have with targeted therapies and immunotherapy. So let's ask a polling question right now. Are you comfortable in recognizing and managing the new skin toxicity, either with targeted or immunotherapy? So I'm happy to see that we need, we have a need for teaching. We have a need to talk about that. Um, I'm not surprised because it's uh, it's changing. It's a constant uh, field that is in evol evolution right now, and uh, really that's one of the reasons we put together this uh, symposium with Laura Pose, and we will have uh, more later on because there is a big need for uh, teaching on that. Next slide. I'm clicking now. So as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, really the research has uh, giving us some targets. It's often from the genetic uh, uh, research where we can inhibit 
um, some molecules. We have some molecules to inhibit that specific, uh, specific site, let's say for BRAF, and for example, in melanoma, but also in neural tumor, we can inhibit, uh, inhibit the BRAF pathway. MEK pathway, often in combination in melanoma, but also in other cancer. And uh, ERK can be also uh, inhibited. Multi-kinase inhibitor inhibition can be used, let's say, in uh, ADNA cancer, uh, kidney cancer. Imatinib is being used in some uh, myeloproliferative uh, uh, disorders. So all those inhibition can give uh, rise to specific uh, side effects. So as I mentioned, many targets, EGFR, PRAF, MEC, mTOR. Up to 50% incidence of skin eruption and 30% can impact the quality of life. The classic is the acneiform eruption, often as, as the same as medical oncologists. Now they know how to treat that. Often they don't refer to us. They will treat right from the start with uh, antibiotic, either topically with clandamycin, for example, or they will treat with minocycline derivative. You can have some severe cases. Often we are asked to see the severe cases they can be super infected with staph or a strep sometimes. We can have some post-inflammatory changes, dry skin fissures, and another specific uh, side effect is paronychia with those EGFR and MEK inhibitors. In melanoma, we treat with anti-BRAF uh, medication. They often give a folliculocentric hyperkeratosis, keratosis pilaris, even can look like pityriasis uh, rubra pilaris. Another side effects we see with anti-BRAF medication is keratoderma. This is a patient of mine being treated with ancorafenid. It's a strong anti-BRAF medication giving uh, some hyperkeratosis and we actually have to stop the treatment and treat the patient with retinoid derivative because the patient was not able to walk anymore. So it's important for us to uh, recommend uh, some treatment to prevent and also good shoes and also maybe treat when it's going bad. Finally, the big chapter is immunotherapy and skin side effects. Immunotherapy is now being used in many cancers. It was, start, it was used at the beginning with uh, melanoma, with epilimumab. Then the two big uh, players were pembrolizumab and nivolumab, now used alone or in combination. And now we even have new molecules in the field of anti di one What it means is now we have some molecules to block the breaks and re-stimulate the immune system to fight cancer. So as I mentioned, anti-CTLA4, epilimumab, trimilimumab at the beginning, not approved now. The big treatment is anti-PD-1 nivolumab or pembrolizumab, as I mentioned, use in melanoma, but you see it's used a lot in lung cancer, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, Merkel cell carcinoma. Now we have a molecule for squamous cell carcinoma, semiplimab, same category, anti-PD-1, same types of side effects, and another group which is less frequently used, anti-PDL1, actually at the ligand, Instead of blocking at the PDL1, we block on the other side, on the side of the tumor, the ligand, PDL1 ligand. It's up to 40, 50% of those patients that will have some uh, skin side effects. Can be just pruritus, 30%. Can be eruption or vitiligo. So if you add those numbers, I will tell in my experience, it's 50% of the patient receiving immunotherapy that have skin side effects. So really important for us to train our colleagues, nurses, pharmacists, medical oncologists, to recognize and conceal, uh, uh, get advice to the patient about those side effects. This is a long list, it's not exhaustive, of all the side effects that have been reported with immunotherapy. Classic maculopapular exanthematous rash, pruritus, eczema, and lichenoid eruption are the most frequent. We can see 
the um, uh, uh, aggravation of psoriasis. This is another side effect that has been described, and a variety of side effects that you have on this table, including bullous disease, granulomatous disease. This is a patient of mine with maculopapular eczematous eruption after a month and a half of anti-PD-1 treatment. This is a patient of mine on the left with lichenoid eruption, a patient of Max on the right, very similar, very itchy, not the classic lichen planus, not the blue violaceous color, it's more like almost like psoriasis form, but when you do the biopsy, it's lichen planus-like changes. Both patients here have psoriasis. This patient on the left was treated with nivolumab for severe psoriasis. It was for adjuvant after that lymph node dissection. Developed psoriasis three months after beginning the treatment. Patient of Dr. Sauter on the right with severe, uh, I think was a previous psoriasis that was exacerbated by uh, immunotherapy. Very difficult to control. Dermatologists have a role on that. And uh, this is a very important side effect for melanoma patients. They develop pitsligo in up to 40% of the cases. It's a good sign when a patient develops pitsligo, it means it responds, but can be bothersome. This patient of 45 years old wanted to stop nivolumab after resection of a long metastasis of his melanoma because of pitsligo. So we had to convince him to continue and, and uh, finish his year of treatment to prevent recurrence. Uh, in Brazil, it's a number one reason of stopping the treatment. And finally, just before, this is a terrible history. Patient was treated with nivolumab for uh, uh, bladder cancer. Developed very severe eruption in a few days. Developed blister and ocular and mouth involvement. Developed into TEN, transferred to burn unit and we could not reverse that. Extremely rare, but important for us to recognize quickly. So I think the oncodermatology team is really important for the nurses to be aware there's a lot of side effect in immunotherapy. Really, the pharmacist also, in, 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 we explain that to the patient, but when they have uh, this, this, this uh, diagnosis of cancer, they are overwhelmed by information. So if any, we just think we're going to have a skin rash, you know, they will often take that with a grain of salt, but it's not the case. Sometimes you have to recognize the signs of severity, which actually are pain, fever, blisters, and mucosal involvement, the classic signs of Steven Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis. So sign of severity, important to recognize and teach to our patient, communicate with the team, and uh, have a good uh, recognition early. I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but you will not be surprised that this has a big impact on quality of life. I mentioned already some of my patients, even my patient with eczema, eczematous eruption, wanted to stop treatment, even though it was for metastatic melanoma. So very important to treat and control those eruptions because it will uh, uh, decrease the motivation of the patient to continue their treatment and impair their quality of life. Same thing. There is a lot of algorithms to treat those eruptions. Often the algorithms are not really adapted to the dermatology practice. It was developed in the, in the uh, setting of a clinical trial with uh, trying to measure the eruption like a burn, like a patient uh, coming at the burn unit. So often we need to adapt. And now we have new algorithms developed by dermatologists and um, uh, even uh, developed by some colleagues in Canada, Dr. Lips and his group, to help us to treat those eruptions. So now it's time for Max to take over. Thank you for your attention and thanks for having uh, me tonight. Thank you, Joel. <clears throat> so um, I think that I'm going to start off this next section with another polling question. Do you recommend skincare products for oncology patients, either before starting any treatment, 
Um, yes, but only after experiencing a skin reaction, infrequently or never. And I must admit that for me personally, even at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, um, it's generally yes, but only after experiencing a skin reaction. Not to bias their answers. Okay, impressive. Uh, so it looks like the majority of people are uh, recommending skincare products. Uh, so quick math, 69%. Um, but more so uh, reactively rather than preventatively. And so what we as a group got together and thought through was really a framework of, of how we can approach um, anti-cancer reactions uh, and, and how we can best address this. And so this is the general principles that, that we're thinking through as a group and that again, we'll have subsequent papers on um, for more specific algorithms and more specific reactions. But essentially, in an ideal world, we thought that having a preventative dermocosmetic regimen uh, of, that's very, very simple, which we'll, we'll go over shortly, um, would be ideal. And it may not be what's happening in actual practice, but maybe uh, it, it would be able to prevent or reduce the severities of, of skin toxicities. And we, we explored the evidence behind that, and I'm going to present to you some, some papers supporting that. Then the patient has their intervention, and their intervention could be uh, multimodal, um, but generally they have you know, one or more of these interventions to treat the cancer. And then they may or may not receive a skin toxicity. And if they do, as Dr. Clavo stated, you really want to make sure that it's not dangerous or life-threatening, such as SJS or TEN. Uh, going through that, making sure that it's not, if it is, aggressive treatment early uh, on. And then if it's not, then getting into the specific management. But what I'd like to focus on here and what the, the uh, skin therapy letter really focused on was what's the evidence behind a preventative dermocosmetic regimen. Um, and so our conclusions from after looking at the evidence was that we do recommend that in an ideal world, we should be initiating a skincare regimen prior to anti-cancer treatments. Um, and, and it should be relatively simple. And it should be formulated in a way such that it's safe, effective, and essentially treating these patients as if they have atopic dermatitis or eczema, um, because their skin is going to be assaulted by all of those modalities. And so really ensuring that it's free of additives, um, free of common allergens, free of fragrances or sensitizing agents, um, and having a near physiologic or pH would be ideal. ideal. And, and again, there is some evidence that I'm gonna present. And then, um, you know, the, the regimen should really be cosmetically pleasant and easy to use and incorporated into, easily incorporated into their uh, daily living. So in terms of evidence of uh, what's out there, what ingredients have benefit, what ingredients don't have benefit, uh, there was a great paper in JAD specifically on radiation dermatitis uh, that looked specifically at several of these ingredients that patients will commonly um, state that they're using or have products that include them that clearly have no benefit uh, and may in fact uh, be slightly irritating. Whereas there are some benefits to using products that may include hyaluronic acid, epidermal growth factor, GM, CSF, topical steroids, specifically in the setting of radiation dermatitis, as well as topical statins. That was a small paper, and again, that was specifically for radiation dermatitis. There were several other papers um, that are looking at topical agents with common ingredients that had soothing characteristics to them, like niacinamide, squalene, pantholon, uh, glycerin, 
and as well looking at the use of wound care products such as barrier films especially for severe fissuring or cracking uh, in the palms and soles and and these certainly were were uh, had positive impact on uh, patient's skin but again those two uh, paper that the, that evidence was all mainly reactive oh, I got it someone else is controlling it for me and try and go back. I think you're going forward. Yeah, I'm trying to go back, Roxanne. Um, I'm pressing the back button. Do you want me to go back for you? Please. Okay, perfect. So in terms of the uh, proactive treatment, there are some very good studies looking at preventative approaches to skin toxicities. They're limited and they are sponsored and they're sponsored by La Roche-Posay um, because they've done a significant amount of work in the realm of oncodermatology. So the first one was specifically a multi-centered international study looking at the um, tolerability and efficacy of preventative skin care. And it included two types of cleansers, a moisturizer, healing balm, and sunscreen. Um, and it had patients in France, uh, Canada, as well as Spain, I believe. And there were 253 women, primarily with stage one breast cancer. And the most commonly used products were the cleanser, moisturizer, and healing balm. And so these were the products that the participants were given and they could use them as frequently or infrequently as they wanted to. And when we look at some of the data behind it, um, you had a higher incidence of patients that were low users um, developing skin toxicity at day 10 or day 14 compared to the heavy users that clearly had a delay um, and less prevalence of patients that were experiencing skin toxicities. Furthermore, uh, when we look at the physician scores, so the physicians were asked, uh, do you think that this had a positive impact, a neutral impact, or a negative impact uh, on the patient's skin toxicity? The physician scores um, demonstrated that the patients that used the products heavily, so that was every day or often, um, much more likely to for the physician to rate the uh, the um, experience positively, uh, whereas the low users were more likely to rate it neutral, some positive, um, but most uh, uh, hardly anyone rated them uh, negatively. Uh, and finally, if you look at the uh, patient benefit index, so um, the percentage of patients that used these products um, that thought that there was a benefit versus no benefit uh, in both groups, the heavy users and low users, all of them across the board consistently thought that they received benefit from using a preventative skincare approach. And so the summary of the study was that the products were tolerable. It certainly did delay the appearance of, of early skin reactions, especially for the heavy users. Um, and there seemed to be a benefit both from the physician and patient uh, perspective. And uh, so it's an interesting approach to, to prophylactically use a simple dermocosmetic regimen to try and reduce or prevent skin toxicities. Uh, which was what the basis uh, of our paper was. Similarly, and a uh, more widely uh, inclusive study was another La Roche-Posay study that evaluated the use of 12 product kits. So this was a little more of a more uh, com complex kit that the patients were given, but they could use any of the products however often they wanted to. Um, and this was across various types of cancers and various types of treatments. So it did include uh, chemotherapy as well as some targeted therapies as well as radiation. And so these were the products that were used. Um, there were cleansers, there were moisturizers, there were sunscreens, 
Um, there were uh, even nail lacquers at the end here. And uh, so across the board, and I don't know if this is showing up so well on everyone's screen, um, but this was really um, the tolerability of the products. So the patients scored uh, good, neutral, or, or not good. And uh, so the majority of the patients had a positive experience. Uh, the, the one thing that stood out was uh, the body sunscreen as well as the face sunscreen. So that one wasn't as well accepted as, as some of the other products, but still a relatively positive correlation. More impressive was they really looked at the different characteristics that the patients were experiencing, specifically breaking down erythema and desquamation of the skin. Um, and the light gray indicates the initial visit and the dark gray indicates the final visit. And while the first bar doesn't look that different uh, in terms of casual users versus regular users, in terms of the patients that did not experience any erythema or desquamation, when you look at the patients that experienced a grade one, grade two, or grade three um, skin toxicity, you can clearly see more activity in the top lines versus the bottom lines um, of casual users versus regular users um, of these uh, skincare products. So unfortunately, that's really all the uh, data that's out there. And it does certainly indicate that there is a greater need um, for education um, to patients, um, as well as more research to be done to show that this in fact can statistically um, improve patient outcomes through reducing or uh, preventing skin toxicities. And really in summary, um, you know, skin toxicities is a growing field and these toxicities can really occur at any time during the cancer treatment, including in the case of uh, immunotherapy well after discontinuation, discontinuation of treatment, as well as for radiation therapy. And as Dr. Claveau pointed out, these toxicities can have a huge impact on quality of life and can be a main reason for treatment discontinuation. While at the same time, there is also some evidence that we really didn't get into that um, patients who do develop skin toxicities or any type of toxicity to immunotherapy uh, indicates a positive response to the therapy. Um, similarly in EGFR inhibitors. So this is in fact the exact opposite time that you would want to take a patient off a treatment if you can manage the toxicity. And possibly proactively initiating a simple regimen involving hygiene, moisturization, and sun protection may possibly prevent or reduce the cutaneous toxicities. And so us as a group, we felt as though again, treating these patients as if they were uh, atopic dermatitis patients and going over a very simple regimen uh, that should not be too complex. You know, they are, these, these people are uh, getting bombarded with a huge amount of information, literally life-changing decisions um, to make. And the last thing that we want to overwhelm them with is a complex skincare regimen. And so, uh, you know, going over a gentle cleanser, going over how to cleanse and how not to irritate or over uh, or dehydrate the skin, um, such as, uh, you know, uh, bathing less than 10 minutes, mild temperatures, gentle cleansers, and then immediately after using uh, a moisturizer that's the appropriate vehicle. Uh, and then finally, uh, because most of these things do sensitize patients to the sun, a daily sunscreen, uh, rain or shine 365 days a year, um, because many of these reactions are UVA uh, sensitive that is constant throughout the year. A good reference that I like to use is producteliminationdiet.com. This is from uh, Dr. Scott Nicky, uh, where she uh, lists common products that are relatively hypoallergenic. And oops, sorry, Roxanne, can you go back? Oh, there we go. So, just in summary, dermatologists and teams, because not everyone is a dermatologist, skincare uh, can certainly improve patients' quality of life, 
and it can improve treatment outcomes, as I indicated. Uh, you really want to rule out life-threatening conditions, just as Dr. Claveau uh, highlighted. And uh, as dermatologists, we can certainly, and, and, and medical oncologists or radiation oncologists, we can certainly recognize and manage common toxicities. For the dermatologists, if you do encounter a uh, reaction that, that you're unsure of, use your morphology or pathology to, to guide treatments and, and reach out to, to one of us that, um, you know, sees this on a regular basis. And possibly we may be able to reduce or even prevent again some cutaneous toxicities through a gentle skincare regimen. And really dermatologists, we're expert in skin and skin disease. And, and what we really want to highlight is that oncology patients are, are no different than any of our other patients that, that we take care of. And with that, um, I will end it and I believe open up the floor for questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Saunders and Claveau for that very thorough and thought provoking presentation. Again, everyone, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right hand side of your screen. If we don't get to answer all of the questions this evening, you can always contact us at rbcconsultants.com. And also, if you have any requests, you can contact Susie Vader at the, uh, she is the hospital medical representative for dermatology and oncology at La roche Posay, And there's her email, susanna.vader at l'oreal.com. And as I mentioned in earlier, this is the first in a series of publications on this topic that is going to be uh, hosted in the Skin Therapy Letter. And this is the link where you can go and get this publication, skintherapyletter.com front slash dermatology, front slash skin care role oncology, but we're gonna send you this link with the recording and with your certificate at the same time. So don't worry, we'll be sending it to you. Again, thank you to La roche Posay for making this educational event possible. So let's go to our um, questions that we have from the audience. So I'm just gonna open the question pane. Wow, a lot of questions. So the first question, I have a patient with pulse head and neck, oops, sorry, it moved while I was reading it. <laughs> we have gremlins. Okay, I have a patient with pulse head and neck radiation who has Reynolds-like syndrome after going surfing. The area seems numb after cold exposure. What do you recommend? Who would like to take that one? Does it go Max? Me? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I would I would basically just treat it like uh, like Ray notes. Um, again, skin cancer patients with with cancer are no different than any of our other uh, patients, and Ray is, is is common. Secondary Ray nodes is common, um, and uh, and so you know central warming. If he's surfing, then uh, that's a great sign, and uh, maybe he should get a warmer wetsuit to, for central heating. Um, and then peripheral vasodilators uh, for, for the hands and, and uh, ensuring that, that his hands as well are warm. Yeah. Another question, is the treatment of immunotherapy cause vitiligo the same as or usual treatments? It's probably yes, we don't have a lot of data on that. <clears throat> what we have right now is good paper showing that we have vitiligo more in the melanoma treatment than other cancers. There is a few case report of vitiligo in patients with, say, for with lung cancer, but most of the cases are in melanoma. Often the patients are suffering a life-treatening condition. We have treated much more patients with metastatic melanoma than uh, adjuvant right now, so often they will not ask for specific treatment. <clears throat> Probably, yes, we could use topical treatments. I, I suppose topical steroids Tacrolimus, I would not recommend phototherapy most of the time in patients with melanoma that have vitiligo, but usually it's a positive sign because 
the patient, we see that, it means the immune, immune system is working and um, um, it's a motivation sign for the patient. We can see also hello nevi. So I think that's why dermatologist is important for us to get involved in the follow-up of those patients because uh, we, have, we are the expert, we examine the skin, we, are, we know how to recognize that and it's good. When the patient is receiving a treatment like that, so often don't have as much side effect as chemo, but they do have side effects. They do have uh, diarrhea, colitis, uh, thyroid problems. So it's motivating uh, for them to know and you can teach your medical oncology team to recognize that so everybody knows about it. So I think uh, we've achieved that. And thanks to Dr. Caroline Robert from Paris that have published nice papers on that and have made us aware of vitiligo as being a positive sign and also a frequent uh, side effect. Of course, yeah. screen and prevention for sunburn in the in patient oh. Another question, to prevent hand and foot syndrome from certain chemotherapy, I recommend the fragrance-free body lotion for body and urea cream for hand and foot. Is it good? Is there better options? No, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Um, definitely for hand and foot um, skin reaction, there, there is certainly a lot of hyperkeratosis. And in fact, in some of the clinical trials um, and some of the, the actual commercial uh, medications that do cause it, they had previously given out urea cream uh, in order to, to prevent it. Um, when you, that's not enough, you need to treat the two components of it, the hyperkeratosis over pressure points, as well as the inflammation um, surrounding it. So the inflammation treated with super potent topical steroids, hyperkeratosis, again, a keratolytic agent like urea, 20 to 40%. Um, but one other thing is counseling patients. So making sure that they uh, have proper footwear, uh, that they're lubricating their hands and feet good, well before uh, activities, um, such as using, there's actually something called runner's glide, which looks like a deodorant stick uh, that you can put on the bottom of, of feet before going on walks, um, because we know that heat and friction um, can add to, to this reaction but that's an excellent suggestion. So another more general question, what are your go-to skincare products for oncology patients? I think Max uh, explained very well. We have to be uh, make it simple because a patient with cancer, they are stressed and we see a lot of cancer, uh, cancer patients that are old and, um, and we, make, we have to make them a simpler routine. So I think the first thing first really is moisturize, moisturize, especially in immunotherapy, they have a lot of pruritus. Winter is coming up. So I think we have to give them the same advice as atopic dermatitis, eczema patient, cut down on the long bath, come down, come down on the very uh, warm uh, showering bath, moisturize, use a gentle uh, uh, soap or gentle uh, um, cleaning cancer like uh, it was presented and uh, really moisturize treat and and sunscreen I really uh, there's a lot of uh, treatment that give photosensitivity the worst was vimurafenil in the melanoma uh, care Zalborav we don't use this medication a lot anymore because the first choice is dabrafenil and tramycinib but it was terrible sunburn UVA so really is the case, but also immunotherapy patient, I find they are more prone to sunburn. So we have to be careful, same thing with chemo patients. I don't know if you want to comment that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, if you're asking about specific products, again, I would highlight the productelaminationdiet.com website by Dr. Sandy scott Um, I do recommend similar products to my eczema patients. And uh, this is not just because this is sponsored by La Roche-Posay, but for moisturizers, um, my, my go-to is Lip Bicar Balm. Um, it comes in large formats, uh, generally uh, very well tolerated. Um, I also recommend a lot of CeraVe cream uh, as well. And then for cleanser, if they do like a liquid cleanser, then Lip Bicar Syndet. Um, if they like a, a solid cleanser, then I, I just recommend, I recommend Dove for sensitive skin bars. And really for sunscreen, yeah, we need a good UVA and UVB coverage. And um, of course, 
uh, L'Oreal products are known for their quality and that. So a practical question, when faced with a patient with skin toxicities due to cancer treatment, what do you do? I think the, there's no one recipe and that's what is difficult in developing guidelines because I think the first thing first is recognize the type of eruption they have. And that's, that's why for the simple stuff, we need to treat uh, our staff, uh, the nurses, the pharmacists, medical oncologists, the main uh, eruption, like we just said, pruritus, exanthematous eruption, eczema, uh, and psoriasis. But they also need to ask us, dermatologists, when they have something special. So signs of uh, severity we have mentioned, but also if they have blisters. We can see granuloma in an area like lesion sarcoid. We can see some uh, uh, Grover's disease, uh, uh, mucositis, any type. So I think it's not one recipe. Go, go back to basic dermatology, trying to recognize the eruption and good, simple skin care and topical steroids, yes, but we need to make a good diagnosis before we start the treatment. What do you think, Max? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I just emphasize exactly what you said earlier, which is uh, first step is you just want to make sure that it's not dangerous or life threatening. Um, you know, look at the mucous membranes, look for skin pain, look for blisters, look for fever. Um, if you've ruled that out, then okay, you've got some time to figure out things. If you don't, then you treat aggressively, you treat early. Yeah, and just a, a, if it's a simple eruption, then really the dermatologist is not available the, the first day. I think the medical oncologist, they can prescribe topical steroids, but it's the classic uh, mistake they do because they are not good in that. We need to teach them is the amount of topical steroid and again, make life simple. We don't need to have 19 different topical steroids for to live. We can live very well with three different types of topical steroid, mild for the face, neck, and genitals, and moderate. If they can know how to prescribe beta derm, B cream, 450 gram, I think they can do a long, uh, uh, a good, a good uh, uh, time and asking us for the more complicated eruptions. I, I completely agree with that, and uh, I'm giving a talk to a, to a local group of dermatolog uh, of oncologists on Thursday, and, and that's really my summary slide. Here are three topical steroids to use, where to use them, how to use them. Uh, when do you start skin surveillance for skin cancer after someone has been diagnosed or treated with cancer? It's an interesting question, but... Uh... I don't know if we should recommend that uh, for everyone. It's the same I think for. It depends on the the treat the type of underlying cancer that they had, the treatment that they went through. Um, you know, if you're talking about melanoma, then we we want to start surveillance surveillance early and and often. Um, you know, if you're if you're talking about uh, a thyroid cancer that's not related to a genodermatosis. Um, you know, and they got uh, their thyroid surgically removed, just like the general population. Yeah. Going for risk factors, if the patient is a uh, blonde, <laughs> red hair, blue eyes, uh, many moles, is as a risk of melanoma and skin cancer. If you have a patient, uh, I know in the past we have there was good publication on the kids that have received uh, chemo for leukemia have increased risk of nevi and developing maybe a uh, typical nevi. I have been followed a uh, few patients that have had a graph, uh, 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 not GDH, but have had allograph or mm -hmm. autograph and they have developed hundreds of nevi. So those patients, they are at risk. But um, uh, I would think the patient that I've seen with cancer are really the patient that have been treated let's say for skin disease 20 years ago where the radiotherapy was much stronger. Now they develop the basal cell on the trunk. But those days, I think the radiotherapy is more adapted and less uh, aggressive. I think. What is your favorite RX for acute and chronic radiation dermatitis, especially if itchy? Thanks. 
Um, so it, it does depend on uh, what the radiation dermatitis was used for. If the skin was the primary target, then I'm less aggressive. If the skin was the innocent bystander, then and they're very symptomatic, then I use a potent topical steroid. Um, depending on the severity of it, the presentation, either betamethasone valerate or clobetazole. There are more studies, most studies are using mometazole. Yeah, I would think we will need uh, later on in the, our programs to uh, speak more with radio oncologists. I notice in my uh, hospital they're very good in treating radio dermatitis, but I don't see the patient being recommended uh, moisturizer and uh, um, their more cosmetic products. I think like if you start uh, radiotherapy for the breast and you will moisturize well before you start, maybe you prevent some uh, severity, at least decrease the severity. So I think there is role for prevention. Same thing for immunotherapy, as I mentioned before. If you scrub the patient, moisturize the skin well, while they treat even there, when they start their chemotherapy, maybe it will prevent some uh, severe eruption. So we need a lot of education in that uh, field. What is thermal water exactly? Is it truly superior to cleansing, dampening the skin with regular water? Um, I think we'll we'll need a La Roche Posay representative to to answer that question. But there there are uh, studies showing a lot of anti-inflammatory antioxidant properties to it. Yeah, thermal water is a combination of water and uh, uh, minerals that um, have some uh, soothing properties. But um, um, actually, a few uh, good studies have mentioned they have a role in decreasing inflammation, even increasing. Uh, uh, wound healing after surgery, so and also it's convenient to use. I would not say it's my go-to first product I recommend for my cancer patient for prevention. I use a lot of thermal water myself after surgery. I find it's very useful in cleaning the wound. Debris and blood is is the enemy for surgery, and it's I find it's very practical to clean the wounds with that. But uh, um, it's part of the treatment. Maybe we should use more thermal water after radio dermatitis to clean and uh, soothe the skin. Yeah. We need more some studies on that. <laughs> yeah. How often do you use prednisone for higher grade skin toxicities? I will let Max respond because one of his favorite. <laughs> um, so again, it depends on the anti-cancer treatment. Uh, with regards to immunotherapy, um, most of the algorithms do state at grade two or higher to use a uh, systemic steroid. Um, however, there is evidence showing that the use of high-dose systemic steroids um, can decrease the response rate and the overall survival and progression-free survival in, in certain cancers. Um, there's also evidence showing that um, it doesn't negatively affect it, but we also know that patients that are experiencing uh, reactions to anti-cancer treatments are probably having a better response than those that, that don't. Um, so use systemic steroids liberally and early in life-threatening situations. Um, however, when you're talking about immunotherapies, uh, most of our eruptions uh, are psoriasiform, or eczematous, or lichen, lichenoid, or lichen planus-like, um, or just paritis. And these are not conditions that we would normally use systemic steroids for. So um, try to avoid the use of systemic steroids in conditions that would otherwise not um, be indicated. I would think um, an extra comment to that would be that uh, uh, working in collaboration with medical oncologists and with those patients, often you will see that if the patient have another side effect, I am not rare to have the patient, let's say, has hepatitis and uh, at the same time having a skin rash. I have had a few patients with uh, arthritis at the same time as a, a severe lichen weight eruption. So then we will tailor uh, the treatment to the um, combination of side effects. If it's purely a skin condition, and we could try by helping and treating well, let's say with uh, strong, uh, not strong, but a good quantity of uh, topical steroids. Maybe we could avoid prednisone and then decreasing the effect of immunotherapy. So really it's a team effort and I really want to urge my colleagues 
to network with their uh, medical oncologists, radio oncologists, and uh, develop some reflex to work in collaboration. Sometimes you don't even need to see the patient. Maybe it can be like telemedicine, sending images and, and sharing some uh, thoughts on that. And one final question. CLL is a blood malignancy that has an associated risk of squamous cell carcinoma. Do you have any recommendations for this group of patients with regards to monitoring? It's a very difficult <laughs> group of patients. I think the first uh, recommendation is surveillance. Those patients need to be seen at least once, if not twice or three times a year by the dermatologist. We need to make aware the medical oncologists and meto oncologists that follow those patients that they are at risk of increased uh, squamous cell. And I, I would think in my practice, they, they are even uh, worse than a uh, graft uh, patient. We can lose patients from uh, uh, squamous cell. Often if they've developed many, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in situ squamous cell carcinoma or aggressive, it's a sign their uh, chronic leukemia is not well controlled. So again, speak with your medical oncologist and collaborate because those are a difficult group of patients and it's a growing uh, 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 risk factor. I, I completely agree with that and also consider chemo prophylaxis uh, in them. Um, so nicotinamide as well as possibly acetretin in conjunction with their oncologist. But yeah, you've got to see them frequently. Um, I, I see them two, three, four times a year. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Sauter and Claveau for an excellent presentation. And thank you all for joining us. Wishing you happy holidays and a happy and safe new year. Bye, everybody. Thanks for thank you. Uh, staying with us. Thanks, Roxanne and the group for the great organization. And thank you again, Marat Jose. Thank you, Max. See you soon.